Voiceover Coffee Shop, episode number 44. Welcome to the Voiceover Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in voiceover. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there, my name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the Voiceover Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in voiceover. If you'd like to know a little bit more about me, feel free to visit my website at www.andrewdmorrison.com. In this episode, we have the amazing Mark Cashman. Mark Cashman is a voiceover artist, a coach, a producer with over 40 years of success in this industry. He is also the writer of the best-selling voiceover book, V.O. He is a national and international voiceover instructor and coach, recognized as one of the top VO instructors in the U.S. and abroad through his classes both in-studio and online. In this episode, we talk about voice descriptors, staying relevant in the voiceover industry, and the art of how to tell your client's story. Hey, Mark, how are you? Mr. Morrison, how are you doing, sir? I am doing excellently. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. So how do you take your coffee in the morning? I, believe it or not, I used to drink regular, you know, normal coffee with cream and sugar. Mm -hmm. And one day, my wife, whose father was Cuban, so she's half Cuban, uh, made me something in, in Cuba and, and in Miami, in Little Havana, uh, that's something that they call a cortadita. A cortadita. You ever hear of it? No, it, that sounds like um, something close to a cortada, correct? Uh, I'm not sure about what a cortada is, but a cortadita, which I get maybe it's a, a little cortada, mm -hmm. a cortadita is not, is, is instant coffee. Okay. And milk. Okay. And it's heated up so that it's as hot as coffee, mm -hmm. but it's in essence, coffee milk. That sounds really good. Oh, it's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, and you can put any kind of milk. You can put a, a skim milk, a half, a, 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 a 2%, 1%, 2%, full milk, whole milk, whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter because it's just, it's milk and coffee, not water and coffee. Mm -hmm. And so it's rich. And of course, you add a little sugar there. So it's, 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 it's sweet. And that is now my go-to coffee every day is a cortadita as opposed to brewing a pot of coffee, which I, which I used to do. And now I can't, it, it, and, and once in a blue moon, I'll get coffee at a, at a restaurant, but, uh, um, but yeah, usually just, I'll, I'll make my own coffee that way. Awesome. How about you? Um, I usually use a French press. I, I used okay. to make a full pot, but um, but just French press. It's a, a lot easier to kind of if if I'm not going to drink a full pot, why let it go to waste? And so, right. if I need to make another French press, I'll make another French press. And 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 how many cups does that uh, uh, can uh, contain? Generally around two, one to two. Okay, all right, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah not bad. Yeah, I I found that uh, that uh, after two, if I have two cups of coffee, that's that's kind of like a limit. It's kind of like drinking. I, I, I'll, I'll, if if I ever order a drink, I'll, I'll only have one, and and when they come back, inevitably with, can I get you another one? I say no, thank. Um, so so uh, I, I, the the good thing is is that I'm old enough now to know my limits. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so what is kind of your origin story into the voiceover world? Like, how did you get started in this industry? Oh, um, it's very strange. Uh, I just heard heard uh, heard something on the radio and and um, and then said that's what I want to do. So really? uh, yes, literally. So back in the in, in the it was in the nineteen it was the late seventies okay. and um, it was nineteen seventy seven and I was living in the Midwest and I was teaching. I was a I was a public school teacher like your mom. Mm -hmm. I did that for five years. Um, loved teaching kind of sort of liked just a few of the kids and 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 um, I hated the system just hated the system and because it was just so claustrophobic and cloistered and and unimaginative and outdated and 
I could go on and on. But um, at the end of the fourth year, they said, okay, this is the last year you'll be teaching the smart kids because they have different different levels. They have the smart kids, they have the medium kids, and they got the, well, they'll call them the special needs kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was teaching the smart track, I guess, if you want to call it smart. They're pretty dumb as far as I was concerned, but they still were in the smart. So I was, I was teaching the smart tier and then, and, and that was hard enough. And then they, they, at the end of the fourth year, they said, this is your last year, you'll have the smart tier. And the next year, in the following year, you're going to have the medium grade kids, the, 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 or the dummies. And I said, no, I said, this is the, 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 the smart one is, is, is bad enough. I am not, I felt like an educated bouncer is really what it came down to. That's all I felt like an educated bouncer. Mm -hmm. So that said, anyway, so I was, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking, what, what, what can I do? I said, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. It's terrible. So as I was going back and forth, driving back and forth from my house to, to school and back and forth, listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. And at that time I heard two uh, 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 people on the air in commercials who just absolutely knocked me out. So the first one was Stan Freeberg. You ever heard of Stan Freeberg? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Stan Freeberg was the, the basically the grandfather, the father of, of, of humorous radio commercial. Right. He was the first one who started that. And he was a satirist and, and a very, he was a famous, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, somewhat famous in, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, sound. He recorded a couple of albums, The History of the United States. And he was a satirist. He was a satirist. Mm -hmm. And anyway, he started, then they, people started coming to him to produce commercials, to write and produce commercials. Well, they were wonderfully imaginative. They were fun. They were creative. They were totally entertaining. And they were the only really entertaining thing that I ever heard on the air, other than, you know, regular music. And, and so I heard that and I really, really enjoyed that. I, I got a kick out of it. Then I heard another guy, uh, uh, two guys actually together, Dick, Bert, Dick Orkin and Bert Burtis. Dick and Bert. You ever hear Dick and Bert? Mm -mm. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. You're going to have to do have, I'm going to have to, I'm going to give you a little history lesson here, right. sir. And then you're going to look up Dick and Bert when we're, when we're done oh, I will. and you're going to be endlessly, endlessly entertained <laughs> by Dick and Bert, endlessly entertained because they brought humorous dialogue to a whole new level. Yeah. To the point where even they were on the cover of time magazine. Jeez. Okay. Wow. That's how famous they were. Mm -hmm. Well, turns out that Dick and Bert and Stan Freeberg lived in Los Angeles. Okay. And I figured that's where they were writing and producing their commercials. And they had all the top talent in the world and, and it was Hollywood and it made total sense to me. Yeah. And so uh, about midway, just to the end of 1977, I, I said, okay. I'm moving to Los Angeles at the end of this year. When I'm done with my fifth year, I am done, done, and doneer. I'll save up enough money to move out, get an apartment. I want to be a writer, producer of commercials, specifically radio commercials. Because it was involving voiceover and voice work and stuff and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'd been a singer, performer. For years after uh, through college and after college in high school college and after college so i did that for a number of years and um and i was a writer i wrote for the school paper i knew how to write mm -hmm. and that was it if i i figured if, if i was a writer and and uh, uh i i figured i could i could do this actually i i, I said if i could be one half as good as these guys, I'd be happy. And here because we they are, were doing 150 it, it, advertisement awards later. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know that at the time. I had no idea. I had no idea if I was going to be successful or not. I had absolutely no idea. And after three months, I, I came here in, in, uh, in 1978 and, and uh, found a place and put down the deposit and got settled in. And after three months, ran out of money because I only had X amount of savings and wasn't independently wealthy. And then I had to make a decision. How am I going to, how am I going to support myself? I 
certainly I kind of just came here to LA. I'm not a writer producer. I'm an unknown. I'm a complete unknown. So I'm not going to be able to do that full time or will I? So I realized, okay, that's something that I needed to do full time. In other words, I needed to keep my days free. I needed to be working from nine to five because that's when studios were open. That's when ad agencies were open. That's when everybody recorded their stuff and went into the studio. That's when actors were available during the day, nine to five. That's when clients were on the line and that's when work was being done. And at that point, were you working under Cashman commercials or were you working? Oh, no, 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 no. I was just, it was just Mark Cashman. It was Mark Cashman and Associates back okay. then. But but it and, was for yourself. It wasn't. Like oh, it was for myself. Other... Yes. Gotcha. And so okay. what I, I realized is I had to keep my days free mm -hmm. to do this. But if I kept my days free to do this and I wasn't making any money initially, I had to find a way to keep the roof over my head and gas in the car and food in the fridge and the phone in the wall. That was when it was in the wall. Right. It was an attached to the wall. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out a way to keep all that going and still do this during the day. Well, there was only one, unless I won the lottery and that wasn't gonna happen. So it meant I had to find another, a second job. Mm -hmm. I wasn't gonna do it during graveyard, graveyard shift, just fucks you up completely. It just completely just does a number on your entire body, the circadian rhythm, all that shit. So I, so I, so, so graveyard was out. So that only meant that I could only, I could do swing shift from five in the afternoon till one in the morning, but I was 29. So having a second job, not that hard. I was 29. I had all the energy in the world. Right. So I got a job driving a limousine. Okay. And I drove a limousine for four years from five in the afternoon till one in the morning and then worked on this during the day and picked up a client here and a client there and a client here and a client there. And, and, and between those little jobs and my driving job, I was able to keep the roof over my head and food in the fridge and gas in the car and the phone in the wall and all the other things that come along with living on your own. Right. I did that for four years until one day, one of the clients that I got during the day, I got a job, a project that paid me in one month what I had made in four years. The equivalent God. One month's work was the equivalent of four years of work driving the limo. So in essence, I kind of won the lottery. Right. But I didn't win the lottery just by, oh, I just won by serendipity. I won it because I've been working at it for four years. What was that job? You it was, believe answer. it or not, it was, it was um, I worked on the, the radio campaign for the governor of California. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And so they had pretty deep pockets mm -hmm. and they were able to pay me a shitload of money to produce, write and produce a whole series of radio spots for the radio portion of the, their political campaign. Somebody else did the TV. I did the radio. Fantastic. And once I did that job and got paid for it, I was able to go to the limousine company and give them notice and say, thank you for for keeping me employed all those years. I really appreciate it, but I have to move on. Mm -hmm. And, and I did. And fortunately I never looked back. Fortunately, I was able to do this full time from that point, which was 1982, 1982. From that point on, that's what I've been doing full time. And I haven't needed a second job. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to sustain it. I, 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 I don't have the energy. I wouldn't have the energy to do it. So, but, but now, you know, I, now I don't work nine to five. I work sometimes nine to nine, depending upon what I have to do. Mm -hmm. You know, right. you do it too. Mm -hmm. You work when there's work and when you there's no work, you even, we work even harder. You work at finding work. That's our, that's the, that's the lot of a freelance agent of a freelance actor. You work when there's work. And then when there's no work, you do the stuff that you didn't have a chance to do when you were working. 
right. which is basically beating the bushes, promoting yourself, getting that stuff out there. And, and that's it. Cause when you're working, you don't have time to promote yourself. Mm -hmm. You and, only have time when you're not working. And, and speaking of promotion and marketing, where does the bulk of your work come from? Does it come from direct marketing such as emails? Does it come from people just knowing it, your name? Like I mean, it's I a know. combination. It's a combination. You know, it's hard to say because I can't track accurately what's coming from where right. only because I've been at this for so long, over 40 years. So, um, a large, a large part of my work comes from referral only because I've been doing this for so long and been at it for so long and I'm a known quantity in the industry. So I get a lot of referrals, a ton of referrals, but I'm sure that there's some stuff that come in that comes in as a result of my uh, uh, marketing um, because my classes are always filled and, and, um, um, and I, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm booked in, in, into June. Uh, and, and past that. So, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I haven't, I, I can't give you an accurate statement as to where, where it's coming from. It, it's all of a piece. Mm -hmm. It's all of a piece because we do different things. The, the more we do, the more we get referred, the more you expose yourself, the, the more people know your name and who you are. And, and, and it's like an embarrassment of riches. And uh, somebody the other day said, you know, I, I Googled your name and something like four pages came up and I said, what are you, what? That's, that's not even, what? Four pages? Where, how could I possibly fill four pages of Google? What? And they said, yes. It did. That's, okay. I didn't know that because I don't Google me. So, right. so I don't know that. But, but after a while, I guess if you just keep putting stuff out there, you, you just become a known quantity and, and that's it. Well, then what do you generally tell um, your students some of their first steps towards marketing should be and, and how they should address their business? Well, the, uh, first of all, the, body, the, 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 the most important thing you need in marketing mm -hmm. is product. Right. You have to have a product mm -hmm. and then you have to, you have to package that product. So the product is your demo or demos right that's the product packaging the product is basically finding a place for it to live mm -hmm. and that's your website so your website's got to be well it's got to look professional mm -hmm. it, um, it, it it's it has a, that's where your demos live so and that's where people visit you and check you out even when you're not there, that's okay because the door is always open. They can come in and they can look around and, and stuff like that. They're not going to steal anything, so, but they can look around and, and see stuff and listen to stuff and things like that. So marketing wise, they have to have a product and they have to have a place. They have to package the product and they have to have a place where that product lives so that they can send the address to everybody in the world and say, hey, my product lives here. Check me out. So product website and then of course promoting getting people to go to the website in the first place so therefore finding platforms and vehicles to get the word out so what does that entail well that entails fortunately now we have all these tools i will tell you this i know i don't want to sound like that old person who says we Andrew, way back in the day when you used to do this, you know, used to walk, you know, uh, 10 miles to, to work, to, to school, shit like that. I hate that shit. That's just, it's such, <laughs> it's just such, but bottom line is we didn't have any of these tools. Mm. When we sent down, when we wanted people to know about us, we sent them something in the mail <laughs> and a it CD. would be a, it would be a CD. That's, that's, that's the nineties where oh. go back, go back, oh, go back a couple go of back. decades, gotcha. go back to reels plastic reels with quarter inch tape on them. Okay. And then you'd have a reel to reel recording thing and you'd listen to stuff like that. Okay. Reels, snail mail, snail mail and reels. Boy, when cassettes came along, people went, wow, this, look at technology cassettes. You know, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then, and then finally CDs and you go, oh man, see, look at, look at it's how, look how technology is, you know, just, just increasing all this. And then of course now CDs, What's a CD? What's right. a CD? Have you ever seen anybody give anybody a CD lately? No, no, even those are, they're passe. Mm -hmm. Now everything is virtual and, and, and stuff like that. So getting back to your original question, a, a, a demo, a website, 
And then, of course, a, a means to promote that website. And now, so that's mass marketing. So that's a constant contact or a MailChimp type of a platform that you use to get the word out. Well, how do you get the word out unless you have a list to get it out to? So therefore you also, part of your marketing strategy is building your contact list, your, your contact list, your, your uh, 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 potential, all the people who are potentially in a position to hire you as an actor. So producers, independent producers and people with, with the production companies and casting agencies and people in a position to hire you. So that's your database, that's your client list that you send out all that information, and that promotion to on a regular basis, every other week, <coughs> once a month, once a quarter. And what are you sending out? Well, usually when you, it's the Andrew Marson newsletter, right? right? And basically what, what is it? So what is that newsletter? That newsletter says, Hey, just keeping your, keeping me top of mind and just reminding you, I still exist. Right. And letting you know what I've just, what I've done the past couple of months. I worked on some great projects. Here they are. If you want to listen to them or even see them and listen to them. I had a great time doing these projects. I'd love to work for you. Contact me anytime. You got, do you, you, if something comes up, you hear my voice in your head, give me a buzz. So once a quarter, you're sending out the newsletter to your database and constantly keeping them apprised of what's going on. So in terms of, in terms of marketing, that's basically it. It's, and it's a constant, I call it being on the self-promotional hamster wheel. Gotcha. I like that. We're, we're just, we just have to constantly, constantly, constantly promote ourselves. Why? Because we're actors and that's department of redundancy department, promoting yourself as an actor an actor who says to the world, Hey, look at me, look what I can do. That's what every actor, every performer is saying. Even the most humble, 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 humble performers, you know, are still saying, thank you for that applause. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> look at me. I'm so glad I was able to entertain you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for your applause. Thank you. But it, that's what actors do. That's why actors are on the stage and most people are in the audience. Right. Because actors want and need and love the attention and the accolades that come with performing and all the, all the perks that come with everybody saying, oh, isn't he wonderful? That's what we do. There's a term, you probably heard it, in terms of self-promotion. It's called humble brag. Yes. Yes, yes, I have. Yes, okay. Which I think is is absolutely brilliant. It's brilliant because it allows you to promote yourself while still including others and making making it not all about you. Right. Which is great. You give credit to others. So the actor who says, I just finished this wonderful play and this ensemble was amazing or this wonderful teleplay or, 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 or uh, whatever the case may be. And, and, and the, and, and the people I worked with were just fantastic, humble brag. So we're always constantly trying to find ways, different ways to promote ourselves and cut through the clutter branding. That's another, that's another thing that I, I kind of look at that with a, with a, with a kind of a side eye, uh, uh, uh on that it's, it's, um, sometimes I, I think a lot of branding is bullshit and I have zero tolerance for bullshit. So, uh, you know, I, somebody, I was just talking to one of my students the other day and they're just getting ready. They're just starting out. And they, and they, they said, uh, could you give me a few, uh, uh, keywords as to what my voice sounds like keywords, because they, that's the SEO thing, right? You know, the SEO thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, keywords that describe your voice, right? Right. That should be on your website. So you got SEO and you get more exposure that way. And, and I, I always kind of push back on that. I, 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 I said, you know, I really do think a lot of these terms are bullshit and, and, and everybody and their grandmother is using the same basic, you know, 30 descriptors of somebody's voice. You don't think it's beneficial when maybe a potential client is looking up, looking 
for a voice with those descriptors that that having it somewhere within your website wouldn't be beneficial? Well, the thing is, is that if, if there are 10,000 voice actors using the same 30 to 50 words. This is true. How are they going to find you particularly? They are not. They are not because everybody is using the same 30 words, 30 to 40 to 50 words. The key words, everybody is using the same ones. How do you differentiate? You don't, you can't. So that's why I find these keywords a little specious. And, 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 I, and I just, uh, uh, part of me makes, part of me rolls my eyes and wants to basically just say, hey, look, while everybody else is using keywords to describe their voice, I think the only way you can really understand what my voice sounds like is to listen to me. So I'm not going to put any keywords in it in, in, on my site at all. I'm not going to use any of those stupid branding words that mean nothing in the scheme of things. Just let's just dispense with the bullshit. Listen to my demos. If you like what you hear, call me. And so I'm, I'm all for just cutting through the bullshit and just not doing what everybody else is doing. I always tell my students, and I'll tell this to you, just to remind this to you, Andrew, don't be a voiceover lemming. Don't do what everybody else is doing in terms, you, not in the general sense. In the general sense, you have to do what most people are doing because that's right. what you have to do. You have to have a demo. you got to have a website. You want to promote yourself. That's, that's normal. But the way you do it, right. I want you to make sure that it's different. Keep I want you to tools, try to figure out execution. what is different about you, what is unique about Andrew Morrison. And I don't think that a couple of descriptor words about what your voice sounds like is going to do you any, it's going to do anything. I can't imagine it's going to do anything because you had one word on there and somebody got, I just can't Im even imagine that right. happening. The only thing I can think of is somebody listens to you, listens to your demo and go, whoa, that's the guy. Where's that? Where have you been, Andrew, all my life? I've been looking for you. So. Does that kind of answer your question about marketing? Absolutely, yeah. No, 100%. And, and so going into demos, what, what made you want to start producing demos? And, 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 and Well, and it was only your... because I had, uh, well, because I had so many students. Okay. And so, so in my classes, and I started teaching the, it, and, and on, in 2000, just the beginning of the, of the millennium, mm -hmm. um, I started teaching. And very soon after I started teaching, with, uh, having all these students, they asked me, they said, I, you know, I, I um, this is in my first rodeo here with classes. I've been taking lots of classes, but this is the best class I've ever had. And I'd love for you to do my demo. Could you do my demo? So the first person who asked me that, I said, yeah, I, I, I think I could. Never having done one before, but I'd been producing commercials right. for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I understood production. You know, I understood copy and I was able to write it and I was able to produce it and I was able to, to, you know, do, a, do as good a job with their demo as I did with, with commercials that were already on the air. So if they were, if I could do air quality, you know, broadcast com quality commercials, then I could definitely do a demo. Right. And that's basically, it was just a matter of just, you know, supply and demand at that particular point. They just asked me, will you do my demo? Right. And so I didn't, I didn't even flinch because I had already been producing thousands of commercials. Why couldn't I do a demo? Right. And so, so I just used the same, just the same knowledge that I had producing commercials to, it involves a person getting behind the microphone, recording them, editing them, finding music and sound effects, mixing it and putting it together. Instead of being aired, it was not, it was non-broadcast because it was a demo, but still the same production values. And I find your coaching very interesting because you use a, um, a scorecard so that way yes. they can, they can track their progress. What was, what was. Yes. Um, it's, what, it's a report card. Right. That's right. I am the only teacher in the world who gives out report cards and, and my report card is graded. You're graded on eight different categories. Mm -hmm. On a one to 10 scale, not A, B, C, D, F. That's bullshit too. Right. So. <laughs> So one to 10 scale, and you're graded in eight different categories. 
Let me see if, let me see, let me pull up my, uh, my report card here. Let me just see what my report card, a different category. I, sh I should know, know them by heart by now, but that doesn't matter. So eight different categories, Andrew, mm -hmm. breathing, timing, articulation, consistency, acting, analysis and interpretation, listening, and something that I call EBM, your eye, brain, mouth coordination. That's the words going in through your eyes, rummaging around your brain and going out your mouth. That loop as you take words in, being able to navigate through copy easily. We, you and I, were very fortunate. Mm -hmm. We have all the wires in our brains. We're connected. Mm -hmm. People who have, are on the dyslexic spectrum, there's a couple of wires crossed. Mm -hmm. There's just a couple of crossed wires in there that make it so that they have time, have a hard time, a challenge navigating through normal, normal text and copy. We got lucky. Only for the great pure, solely for the grace of God, do we go, we got lucky, we were able to figure that all out. Now, it didn't hurt that our parents read to us when we were little, mm -hmm. that, that's, they did that for sure, but we still had the wiring to do that. So that's why when we were in elementary school and junior high school and high school, and the teacher said, who'd like to read this out loud, we raised our hands because we were confident in our ability to speak out loud. We were confident in our ability to read and comprehend. We were confident in our ability to understand grammar and spelling. We we're confident in our ability to navigate through the English language with confidence and aplomb. We got lucky. We also got lucky just being born in this country. We got lucky being born to middle-class parents. We got lucky being born, well, truthfully, white. We got lucky. We won the lottery. We won the lottery. We got lucky. You got lucky that you have a beautiful speaking voice and singing voice. We got lucky. Yeah. Always yeah. keep yourself humble. Always be grateful for everything you have. The happiest people are the most grateful. And with your um, with your report card, um, how? Do oh yes, you... the report card. Sorry, how... no, I got no, off no. on a tangent so, there. <laughs> so, 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 how do you train people for for better voiceover breathing? Because especially with um, long form narration, I, uh -huh. I it, it's not hard for me to have that loop because I, I've been doing essentially uh -huh. long form narration my whole life without knowing yeah. it. But yeah. but finding those those places where to breathe naturally but then i'll get like a 45 second script and they'll be like we want no breaths in it and it'll or, or something mm -hmm. else. how do you how do you train yourself for better breathing um practice just practice it's just practice it's just it's just purely a matter of practice it's all it is it's is there, it, is there practice by the way practice does not make perfect mm -hmm. practice rarely makes perfect practice occasionally makes perfect but it always makes better. Right, it does. Yes, but it doesn't always make perfect. They say practice makes perfect. No, practice hardly ever makes perfect. Once in a blue moon, you get a perfect shot. You do it perfectly, mm -hmm. but that's once in a blue moon. And that's never the take they use either. That's never the take they use. <laughs> never the take they use. But sometimes you, you, you so, get sometimes, one. sometimes. But, yeah. But again, you know, getting 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 a, a perfect take is like the, the a, a baseball player, a batter getting a home run on the first pitch. Right. That's how rare it is. It's rare. Most of the time, it's take after take after take after take after take until you finally get something that the the producer is happy with, and then even then. The producer may not use that entire full take. They may go back and cherry pick some of those other takes and take a sentence from this one and a sentence from that one and, and put it all together. And the listener would, is none the wiser. So what do you find is, is best? Um, what, what do you incorporate into your routine as far as breathing practice goes? You know, it's become so second nature to me mm -hmm. that I don't even think about it. It's, it literally is second nature. Gotcha. Uh, only because... Again, I started singing, performing, and singing when I was 14. And so by the time I was, I was 20 or 21, graduating college, as far as I was concerned, I was going to be a professional musician and performer. 
I had a group. I had a, I, 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 I've been already singing and performing for years. By the time I graduated college, I paid my half of my, my, my college tuition through singing and performing and, and playing. So it was inevitable. So I've been doing that for so long, for so many years of, of, of singing and performing. So breathing is second nature. Uh, to me, you know, it, it all comes from the diaphragm. You, you have to have that support and you have to understand again. Also, don't forget to, as, as you're, as you're telling a story, we speak in phrases mm -hmm. and many, many times we'll say a something, we'll say a phrase and we'll shut up for a second and then another phrase and another phrase. And we, we go from phrase to phrase to phrase, tiny, tiny little sound bites that people can digest, understand, and then you move on. That's how most commercials are written in phrases. That's why so many sentences are so short. <coughs> Got me. some, need some water? Uh, yes. Go get some water. George has been very dry. Oh, yes. So, so the bottom line is, is, um, is I, I teach my students to speak in phrases mm -hmm. like they normally speak. And particularly for commercials, mm -hmm. I try to get them to get off the page. They might say, well, that sounds totally counterintuitive. They're voice actors, aren't there? Isn't their job to read words? No. If they're voice actors, that means they have to act, not read. So how do you help? I make a distinction, by the way, between voiceover and voice acting. Mm -hmm. Voiceover, to me, is 2.9% APR financing for 60 months and all vehicles in stock. There's no acting involved in that. It's right. just saying words. Right. But we're, we're actors. We're voice actors, not readers. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, you can only do that when you have the opportunity. When you've got commercials, short, short, short phrases and short you have some sentences that are one word sentence mm -hmm. or two or three word sentence. You don't need to read any of that stuff, but for the denser stuff, the e-learning and the explainer videos and things like that, that are really, really dense with thousands of words in them. You can't get your eyes off the page. Very difficult for get you because if you take your eyes off the page, you lose your place. Right. You, it's very dense. You got to stay on the page. You still have to sound like you're talking to somebody as opposed to reading. So how do you help people get out of their heads in that way? I have a number of techniques, a number of techniques that, that force them into that situation where, where again, they are going, I, I teach them how to sound like they're not reading whenever they have the opportunity to do that. And the more they do that with short form stuff like commercials, they're able to, to apply that to longer form stuff. Words get in the way. Sometimes they literally get in the way mm -hmm. of you telling your story because people, a lot of people, they just want to glom onto these words and hold on to this, these words like they're lifeboats on the Titanic. And, and, and so I, I'll, I'll teach a, a certain techniques to help them get off that page when they have the opportunity to do so. Because it answers the age-old question, how do you sound like you're not reading? Don't read. Right. Right. So, so I, I show them how to do that through commercials. And then through, and then, and, and also uh, make them understand what acting is all about. And, and, and re remind them of the definition, the classic definition of acting from Stella, Stella Adler and, and, and Sanford Meisner. Basically, who defined acting is very, very simply behaving truthfully Under in an imaginary, imaginary situation. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly it. And that's what acting is all about. So I just remind people, you're an actor. You're not a reader. You're an actor. Act. Right. Behave truthfully in an imaginary situation. Let's do that right now. And just go through a series of exercises to, to get them there, to, to, under, to help them understand that we've gone beyond reading. Mm -hmm. I remind them, and you never, you never saw a play where somebody comes on stage with a script in their hand. 
You never seen a movie where somebody comes on location on camera with a script in their hand. Mm -hmm. They know what they're going to say. Now, we don't have to memorize huge swaths of copy. We're not stage and on-camera actors. We're voice actors. That said, that doesn't mean that you are going to read every single thing you do. Right. So we go through a number of iterations. We'll go through commercials, narration, audiobook, promos, uh, uh, animation, video games, all sorts of different genres of voiceover, voice work, so that, so that people can see the areas where, okay, I don't need to read this, and others where, okay, I need to stay on the page on this. But the more they get off the page, the easier they find long-form narration to be. Awesome. Gotcha. So with you being in commercial production for so long, how have you seen, like maybe past five years, how have uh -huh. you seen the commercial space change as far as readings go or as far as um, how auditions have been betrayed or, or things of that nature? Well, I, I know, I know that, you know, when, when people audition, I mean, you know, now the, 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 the general rule of thumb is if you have agents, mm -hmm. then the agent will send you the audition, uh, uh, through your email, you will record it and you will send it in. You'll reply to that email and, and, and submit it. And, and that's it. The days of people going into their talent agencies to audition physically are gone. Oh, I, I mean, as far as, as far as the reads go, how, how, oh, the actual how the reads. reads have changed, how the scripts have changed, well, how advertising I, I, has changed. I don't know how the reads are going through uh, with, with auditions, but I just, the only way that you can hear what the reads are is the ones that they pick and the, which are the ones that are on the air. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, in terms of production, uh, I've noticed uh, that what, there used to be a lot of produced spots. Stan Freeberg and Dick and Bert and many, many other uh, 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 terrific uh, uh, producers, writer producers, would create commercials for companies, specifically radio commercials. Well, I've noticed over the past 20 years um, that more and more, that, that entire process of, of independent production, independent production companies writing and producing radio campaigns for companies is almost non-existent now. Now, if you listen really, really carefully, you'll hear a lot of spots that, well, are just, they're, they're boring. They're, 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 they're announcements. Right. And they're usually done by radio stations. They're written and produced by radio stations. Because mm -hmm. the radio station offer is, if you buy $10,000 worth of, of airtime with us, we'll throw in the commercial for free. And you get what you pay for because they'll take their on-air talent, their staff, their, their, their staff of talent, and they will be the ones to do the VO. And somebody else on the, on, on the team will, will be the copywriter. And it's always an announcement, virtually always an announcement. Something that starts with attention Walmart shoppers or anything else like that. It's an announcement. So when you listen to particular, particularly to AM radio, you won't hear anything creative at all. Right. The only create the only creative radio now is coming out of FM, mm -hmm. and that's still it's still going, still going strong. So I I, I give FM, uh, I give FM the 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 thumbs up on at least they are still staying true to to creative radio and entertaining radio and fun radio and mm -hmm. you know ra you know stories with a sense of humor and stories that are written well and had some wit to them, stuff like that. AM, it's a desert. It's a complete desert. Again, Freeberg and, and, and Dick, uh, Dick and Bird and many, many other pe uh, people in the, in the, I think the golden age of, of, of uh, creative commercials on uh, AM uh, was in the, uh, the 80s. Really, the 80s were their, their, their heyday. Um, when you listen to Dick and Bert, you'll hear spot after spot. And you go, oh, yes, I remember those guys. Yes, of course, I remember them. But um, I look forward but, to that uh, work. But, but yeah, the, in, in terms of um, uh, how production has changed, a lot of radio stations are, are doing it, and it's, it's just deadly boring. It's boring as dust. 
Well, what about uh, like trend changes and stuff like that? Do you see? Because I I know we had that little bit where where during the pandemic where we had that kind of awkward humor and then things yep. transitioned into new normal and now things are like slowly going back to. They're going to, back. To, to yeah, they're going they back. Were. So like, do you see like um, because you do get a lot of copy? Do you see any like? forecoming trends that voiceover artists yeah. can be prepared for? Yeah, uh, it's, it's not even to be prepared for it. All they have to do is listen. Mm. All they got to do, all you have to do is listen, per particularly to, to TV, to commercial TV. Now, I know a lot of people in your, your generation um, uh, are not commercial TV watchers. You're more on YouTube, you're more online, you're, you're more on, on streaming services and stuff like that. And, and commercial TV is not your bailiwick. But that's where the commercials are. And you have to start really, really listening. I encourage all everybody who really wants to listen carefully to get a set of headphones while they're watching TV, wireless headphones, so they can walk around. If they've got a DVR, that's even better because if they got a DVR, they can rewind and listen to it over and over and over again. Right. And really, really get the nuance of, of what's going down. So all you got to do is listen. One of the trends, if you listen carefully, one of the trends that you'll hear is, is something that I call chill. Um, and that's basically a quieter read. Right. Much quieter read. So uh, the Allstate campaign mm -hmm. is a perfect example of this uh, woman who's doing the, uh, uh, the VO. This woman is chill with a capital C. And if you listen really carefully to lots of campaigns lately, that's the trend. I've noticed yeah. that because people don't want, especially with the millennial buyer generation now, people right. don't want to be sold to. That's so exactly it's right. Less of that sales. They don't want push. that bombastic announcer. Nope. 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 Not at all. No, so they don't want. They don't want that. They don't even want this snarky guy who says, "Come on, you want? What are you going to get? You might look at this twenty nine ninety nine. It's it's a, it's a deal." You know. They, they don't like that. So right. the, 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 the overall, that's basically the trend is chill, mm -hmm. but it, it, it follows the mantra that I've been teaching for the past 20 years is the phrase, tell me, don't sell me. Right. And that's basically what you want to do. You want to tell people about what you're talking about. You want to share what you know. You don't want to sell them. You don't want to try to force them into anything or convince them to do anything or plead or beg or anything. All you got to do is tell them. That's, all, that's your job. Just tell me. Just tell me about it. Let me make the decision. That's it. That's, that's it. it. So, so, so that's the, I would say that's the biggest trend right now. Gotcha. And I know you're working on your second book, which uh, your first one was phenomenal. Vo, oh, thank you. What uh, what was what made you want to sit down and, and write a voiceover book, let alone an award winning now voiceover it, book? I, the only reason was because people kept saying, "Why don't you have a book? Everybody else has got a book. Why don't you have a book? You've been doing this for all these years. Why don't you have a book?" Mm -hmm. So it was just a lot of peer pressure, to, uh, uh, and and um, and I had all I had also been writing articles for decades and i had just a whole compilation of articles and i said okay i i let's see can i is this a is this worth a book so i organized it all and i saw okay i got maybe about 75 percent of a book here so i just need to write another 25 percent to fill it all out and that's what i did then after i finished the book i said oh thank god i you know got that all out there's you know just shot that wad and 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 and, and it was cool and then uh, like a month later i said Oh, you know, I, I never wrote about this. I forgot to write about that. Right. Uh, well, why didn't I include this? And so I realized I have enough for a second book. So my I've got a working title for my second book. My first one is V hyphen O H V O exclamation point. Right. And this, the working title for my second, my sequel is V hyphen O M G. Gotcha. I like that. That's I'm it. Really looking forward to it. Me too. <laughs> More than you. <laughs> so with, with coaching and, and voiceover and production, and you, you've got a lot on your plate, what do you do outside of the booth? 
What, what, oh. do, you, what do you do to unwind? What are, what are things that you enjoy? I love going to the beach. I just love uh, uh, just walking up and down the beach and just getting a lot of fresh air and doing a lot of just doing a lot of walking in, a, a, along the the Pacific Ocean. Um, and and so I, I would say that's my that's because I'm in the this closet in this booth, you know, the, the room, this tiny little room. You know, uh, when you're in in a hundred square foot room for for days on end, you kind of crave getting outside. So that's so that's that's pretty much it. I, so so hiking, walking, and uh, just being outside, and is is and of course taking my dog. So uh, um, so that's yeah, that's it. I've uh, nothing, uh, no no super hobbies or anything else like that. Uh, uh, just just um, just getting out and taking a break from being inside all the time. So if you were to write yourself a letter and send it back to when you were still driving for limos, what would that letter back to yourself say? You came out here for a reason. Make sure that you follow your game plan. That's, it would just be that simple. But there was a moment that I had where I saw the writing on the wall. And so it was a sign and, 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 and here, and, and it, it happened this way. So I came to LA, as, as, I, as I said, in the summer of 78. And uh, of course, by the fall, by September, I had run out of money. And so I had to get this job driving a limo. So, um, uh, so I started driving in September of 78. In October of uh, the next month, uh, all my hard work had finally paid off where a big ad agency in Los Angeles was hiring me to do my first job. And it was for a big uh, amusement park called Knott's Berry Farm. Knott's Berry Farm was, uh, uh, was here before Disneyland and Disneyland almost modeled themselves after Knott's Berry Farm. Yeah. It was an amusement park with rides and, and games and, 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 and performers and uh, amusement park. It was just, which is great. Anyway, they hired me to do a spot for Knott's Berry Farm. It was my very first spot that I did in Los Angeles. And they paid me a whopping $500 back then, which was, which, which at that time was, wow, that was, that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And of course I had to pay everybody, everything out of that $500 to the studio and, and the musicians and the, and the, and, and the voice actors and stuff like that. But still it was my first job. So I did that job in October. Now I'm finding myself in November. I'm still, of course, I'm still driving. October, November, I'm still driving. And I'm taking somebody to the airport and I'm driving to the airport and the radio's on and I hear my spot on the Don't air. You just love that. I heard my spot on the air. I'd been in Los Angeles for five months, July, August, September, October, November. I'd been in Los Angeles for five months. I was in the largest, one of the largest media uh, uh, centers in, in, in the world. I'm competing against the top producers in the world. I'm a nobody. But I got my spot on the air in Los Angeles right. so that millions of people were hearing it. And I did that within five months of my hitting the ground in Los Angeles. That's awesome. That, that is was great. a sign that was a sign. I said to myself, if I can do this within six months of doing this, if I can do this, this is proof that I can do this, then this is, then that was it. So as far as that was concerned, there was no turning back. There was no question as to whether or not I could do it because I did it. Was it a huge campaign? No, it was for it was for Thanksgiving. It was a Thanksgiving campaign, so it just ran that month. That was it. But I did it. Mm -hmm. it wasn't big. It wasn't splash. It wasn't a huge campaign. It wasn't a national campaign. It was a local Los Angeles. But it was still I proved that I could do it. And so from that point, that was my template. I said, okay, if I can do that, there's the, I, then I can do other things. I can parlay that into other things. So that's really. So he asked about the letter. The letter was, you came here to do something, see it through, do due diligence. Don't doubt yourself, 
keep moving forward like a shark and just keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. The reason that I think that I'm, that I was, uh, I'm still doing this now is purely one of tenacity. I'm like a terrier on your pant leg. Once I decide to do something, I do it. I just be, uh, see it through. Does that mean I'm always successful? No, that's the whole thing. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid to fail. Because if I fail, I know at least I tried. And if I don't try, that means then I'll never, I'll never have success or failure if I don't try. Right. So I try to the best of my ability, hope that it's successful. But if it's not, it's not the end of the world. It is not the end of the world. And I don't beat myself up and say, oh, what a stupid idiot you are. You don't even bother doing this again. That's, that's, the, that's just, that's a loser mentality. It's just a total loser mentality. You do as best you possibly can. And if you, if it, if it doesn't succeed, there are a number of reasons for it. And it, some of them are beyond your control. Timing, uh, um, um, the market. Uh, I mean, there are just so many, so many reasons. I'm not saying that you're not, you, you have to, you have to accept your, you have to accept responsibility. You can't, can't uh, it's, uh, pass off your failures. Oh, well, my, I failed because of him and, and that and this and everything else like that. That's, that's, that's a loser mentality completely. If you don't own it, if you don't own it, then you're, 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 you're just, you, you don't understand shit. Okay. You don't understand life, you know, be a man and own it. I if you like make that. mistakes or whatever it is, but, but bottom line, it, it, don't be afraid to fail. Do the best you possibly can. Figure out way, figure out how you're going to accomplish something the best way possible. But don't beat yourself up if you if you fail. Don't. It's just keep on keep your eyes on the prize. Wonderful. And where can people find you in your amazing book or book you for coaching? Oh, so easy. Cashman Commercials. Just remember Cashman Commercials. So mark at cashmancommercials.com. Cashman Commercials, the website. That's it. Cashman Commercials. That's it. M-A-R-C, not K. And plus that whole Google thing. All you got to do is just Google my name and, and oh my God. Pages, right? just, four, <laughs> just Again, an embarrassment of, 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 of info. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible not to be able to find me somewhere uh, right. and, and somehow. And, and, um, and I'll always get back to you. Always uh, uh, respond, and and um, uh, never too uh, uh, not humble to to do that because everybody, people need help and or guidance or advice or encouragement or all of those combined. I really hope you enjoyed all of the phenomenal wisdom Mark provides in this industry, both on how to tackle each step of your career and how to do so with a sense of mental clarity. If you'd like to know more about Mark or would like to take classes with him, you can visit his website at www.cashmancommercials.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.